Welcome to Muskegon History and Beyond with the Lakeshore Museum Center. For many of our podcast episodes on various places and people, you've had the ability to see the place or see things left behind by the person still in Muskegon today. However, the topic of today's podcast is more notable for its absence. A journey to its location might leave you a sense of its footprint of old, but it will be hard to picture it. On today's episode, we talk about the formation and removal of Pigeon Hill. Our journey begins in what is commonly called the Ice Age, but what scientists refer to as the Pleistocene. During this epoch, glaciation is occurring on a wide scale, and the land that we know and love today as Michigan was being molded, squeezed, and rearranged. As these glaciers advanced and retreated across our state several times, they crushed up rocks and minerals to tiny particles, and they dug out large craters. Around 11,000 years ago, they began to melt back towards their current positions, and as this happened, the sand and debris they had created and pushed along with them deposited in the craters and on the shores of the lakes being created from the melting glacier water. Through this, Lake Michigan was created, also the river that would eventually turn into the Muskegon River. Over time, the deposited materials would be sorted by wave action and wind so that the smaller sand particles, made mostly of quartz, would be pushed ashore. They would then dry and get blown by the prevailing west-to-east wind. At a spot on a peninsula between the channel, Lake Michigan, and Muskegon Lake, something blocked those small sand particles or slowed the wind enough so they fell out of the air. Maybe it was a tree or a large shrub or even just a slight bump in the elevation. We will never know. But over time, more and more of the sand piled up at this obstruction until the sand hill itself became an ever-expanding barrier. On the Muskegon lakeside, river sediment washed to the shore and dried, creating much the same process when an east-to-west wind blew, and so a giant sand hill sprouted. This hill became a destination for early Native Americans who used its superior height as a vantage point. Its shady tree-covered hillside with cool lake breezes also made it a great summer destination. When the Ottawa Indians arrived, they too saw its use and made camp near its base, fishing the channel and lakes while also gathering berries and nuts from the vegetation on the slopes. The hill also was a popular destination for animals to nest in or to find food. One animal in particular that used it as its home was a now extinct passenger pigeon. It was these large flocks of pigeons who stopped there that gave the hill its name. Sadly, those pigeons would be wiped out in Muskegon by the 1880s, not surviving the lifespan of the hill and passenger pigeons as a species would become extinct in 1914. As European traders and settlers moved into the area, they also saw the advantages that Pigeon Hill offered. The hill soon became a popular destination for those local and for those abroad who wished to climb the slope to catch the view of the lakes and Muskegon County laid out before them. In the wintertime, the hill made a great destination for those brave enough to sled or ski down it. During the warm months, picnickers and outings routinely made the hill their destination. Educational and artistic experiences were also taught there, as many a painter and poet found inspiration in the hill, including Douglas Malick, Wally Berg, and Victor Casanelli. Trigonometry students from Muskegon made measuring the hill a fun school activity and give us a good estimation of its height in 1907 as 217 foot tall, which is just under the size of two high point flats the tall white building in downtown Muskegon, to give you some perspective. That the hill was an attraction was not lost on outsiders coming to the area. Parts of the hill were owned by private individuals, including a David Irwin, who was approached by a Chicago group of investors who wanted to turn the hill into an amusement park. The proposed park would include an observation tower at the top, a scenic train route riding around the hill, and slides from the hill down into Muskegon Lake. Now, I don't know about you, but this sounds pretty awesome. Difficulties of building on a sand dune aside. This deal, however, didn't take, and many sections of land were sold to people who built cottages at the base of the hill. While using its natural setting was one of the most common thoughts, using the actual sand of the hill was a target of other businessmen. In 1879, the Muskegon Lake Railway Company was given rights to build a track along the base of the dunes running parallel to Beach Street. They used these tracks to bring rail cars to the hill and fill them with sand. At the time, this business was hit or miss, as depending on the cost of shipping, a profit could be made when demand was high for sand in foundries in Chicago and other industrial centers. 
These early sand mining operations didn't worry those at the time much, as it was believed that the sand was near limitless. In an 1899 article in the Chronicle, it says of sand mining of the dune, It is certainly an inexhaustible mine, Old Pigeon Hill, itself capable of supplying a century's demand without touching any of its neighbors. However, as was believed with the pine trees of Michigan, it was discovered inexhaustible doesn't go as far as you might think. As a point to this writer, if we try to calculate the amount of sand in Pigeon Hill, it does seem like a Herculean task to remove it all. Using Google Maps and its distance measuring tool, I calculated the base of Pigeon Hill, which I estimated to be from around Dockers towards the southeast, approaching Wilcox Avenue, and then from close to Beach Street on the west side towards Muskegon Lake. I then used its estimated height of 217 feet to do some math. I used a formula to estimate the volume of a pyramid for the hill. While the hill was far from a triangular shape, I think this will give us a good estimate with the information we have available to us. Based on these calculations, Pigeon Hill had a volume of 601,444,582 cubic feet, which is a lot, let me tell you. What I would like to do now, though, is change that number into the number of tons of sand that could fit inside that volume. So if you were to order sand today, it's roughly about 20 cubic feet to get one ton of sand. So if we divide our volume by 20, we get 22,147,859 tons of sand contained in Pigeon Hill. Now if you are math inclined, please check my work on this and let me know what you get. Depending on where you measure, there will be some variability. But yeah, this does seem like an almost limitless amount. However, it would not take long at all to exhaust all this sand. In 1903, a company called the Muskegon Sandstone Brick Company built near the base of the hill to have easy access to its sand. At the factory, they combined the sand with lime to create a brick that was advertised to be cheaper than normal brick, but just as durable. In 1903 as well, a businessman named John Vettenheimer built an expanded rail track along the base of the hill and began shipping out sand, averaging three rail cars full a week. That same year, a writer in the Chronicle mentions the need to preserve the hill as a tourist destination and worries about the dangers of carting away sand, like what happened in Michigan City, Indiana. No serious preservation movement was attempted, though, until the 1920s. What happened at this time was that the Pierre Marquette Railroad Company and Nugent Sand planned to expand a sand mining operation they had and wanted access to a track that ran along Beach Street, but had not been used for several years and was deeply buried with sand. Residents in the area opposed this as they feared the sand being mined away in amounts that were going to have a serious impact, as in the 1920s, foundries started springing up in the area, and the need for sand to make molds increased several fold. On June 25, 1925, two plans were proposed to save Pigeon Hill, whereby in one plan, the city would use a bond to purchase the land from Nugent Sand, Pure Marquette Railroad, and Robert Ferguson, a private landowner, so that the hill would all be under city control and could be preserved. The other plan was for a group of citizens to buy it and then sell it back to the city with the understanding that the city would preserve the hill in perpetuity. However, the two companies would not sell, so neither plan was accepted. It was at this point that citizens took another route. They went to court arguing that the tracks that the railroad company wanted to expand and repair that were buried should be considered abandoned and that the company didn't have the right to use it, which would impede the mining operation tremendously. The case ended up going to the Michigan Supreme Court in December of 1926. At the court, they decided that the tracks were not abandoned and that the company didn't need to get permission to uncover and repair them from the nearby homeowners, as the original rights for the track and land had been attained on December 1, 1879 by the Muskegon Lake Railway Company, and these rights were sold to Nugent and Pierre Marquette through purchase of that company. While the tracks were for a long period not in use, they had been used frequently enough to warrant not being considered abandoned. With this ruling in hand, Nugent created a company called Sand Products Corps, which took over the operation. They extended the tracks and also built a dock for freighters to access the sand. The first load of sand was shipped out in May of 1928 and was 6,000 tons worth. Sand mining continued, and by the early 1940s, small mounds were all that remained of the hill. By the 1950s, the sand was all removed and mining shut down. For many years after, the property sat vacant until in 1992, the construction of Harbortown neighborhood began. 
Thank you for listening, and we'll be back in two weeks with our next episode.